Hi, it's Jerry. Before we start this episode, I wanted to let you know, if you live in the Philadelphia area, I have great news. Not only will I be doing a live show of FBI Retired Case File Review at the Respect Women's Podcast Festival on Saturday, August the 24th at noon at Amalgam Comics and Coffee House in Philly, but my special guest is none other than Special Agent and FBI Recruiter Serena Coughlin. So if you live in the Philadelphia area and you have questions about joining the FBI, I hope you can come and meet me and Serena in person and ask your questions. And come early because I'll have stickers, buttons, and bookmarks to give away. There's more information on my website. Hope to see you on Saturday. Now cue the music. Welcome to episode 180 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak once again with retired agent Michael E. Anderson, who served with the FBI for 28 years. His initial assignment was with the San Antonio Division, Austin Resident Agency, where he worked white-collar crime matters. In this episode, Mike Anderson reviews his investigation of German national George Dudoff regarding a money laundering scheme that netted $2.3 million from people who thought they were investing in oil wells. In furtherance of the scheme, Dudov also participated in a passport fraud scheme to bribe an immigration official to issue him a fraudulent American passport, and he attempted to hire a hitman to have an associate killed. Later in his bureau career, Mike Anderson was a supervisor at FBI headquarters before reporting to Houston as a white-collar crime supervisor managing highly complex financial crimes and intellectual property investigations. We previously spoke to Mike Anderson in episode 129 about the Enron investigation, the largest and most complex white-collar crime case in FBI history, for which he received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service. Mike can be contacted via his LinkedIn profile. Mike suggested that we dedicate this episode to FBI agent Brian Cruz, a colleague who worked with him on the Enron investigation and who died of cancer in 2018 as a result of his work as a member of the evidence response team at the World Trade Center following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Before we get to the interview, I want to make sure that I invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I send out a email digest to keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV and movies. I usually review a TV show or movie or book about the FBI and let you know what they got right or what they got wrong about FBI procedures and keep you up to date on my author journey. If you're not a member of my reader team, then you can always sign up at my website, jerrywilliams.com, or if you're listening to this on a podcast app, just look for the link in the description of this episode. If you've already picked up your copy of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, thank you. And special thanks for those of you who have posted a review on Amazon. Wow, five stars. I want this book to become the book to read if you're interested in learning more about the FBI. FBI Myths and Misconceptions is available wherever books are sold, as well as the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series. Thank you for the support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Michael Anderson. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hello, Jerry. Doing well. I hope you're doing well, too. 
Well, I'm doing great, especially after we've been able to work out our recording snafu. For some reason, Zoom wasn't working correct. So instead of us communicating over the internet, we're communicating by telephone. But, you know, it's not perfect, but I think it sounds okay. I can hear you five by five. It's a good old FBI line there. It brings back memories. <laughs> the last time we spoke, we were talking about Enron. And I can tell you that that episode has some of the largest downloads of any of the other episodes that I've done. People are fascinated to hear about the Enron investigation directly from one of the agents that worked on that case. So thank you. Definitely thank you for allowing me to share that case review with everyone. That's great. That puts a lot of pressure on me on this time, though. I've got to live up to that billing this case. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you will. I, I think Enron is a case no. everybody knows about and is curious about. And this one is one of those cases that is absolutely fascinating, but little known. So where do you want to start? I always thought this case would make a good movie. It involves a con man who's involved in a murder for hire, bribery to obtain a passport, and then he's running a Ponzi scheme selling shares in non-existent oil wells. And we packed a lot of investigation into a short period of time because of the murder for hire and then the passport issue. We went from case opening to arrest in about two weeks which doesn't happen often. Wow. No, I didn't know that. And the other thing is, you know, I've been able to read up on this case through newspaper articles and some some things that you sent me, but none of it really talks about the murder for hire. So I'm going to be hearing all about this for the first time also, along with uh, everybody else listening. Yeah, this was, this was a very unique case. I've never had a case where I've done, or any other case where I did, a warrantless arrest, and we'll talk about that later, but just just how broad this case was and that it involved in so many things made this case unique and made it a lot of fun to work to. For an agent, there were a lot of cool things that we did. And I think to kind of set set the, the, the foundation or set a basis on which we can work from, let's talk a little bit about the subject, George Dudoff, and who he was. Okay. And like I say, it'll help understand where we wind up in January of 1994 when we do this arrest. So Dudoff was born in 1960, either February the 6th or June the 2nd. And the reason I think, at least for me, that there's an uncertainty is Europeans put the date before the month. So I've seen it written both ways. But he was divorced and had, at least in 1994, he had two children that were ages two and four. But he had a very checkered background. He went to reform school for stealing mopeds. And then he started an apprenticeship in radio and television as a technician. But he escaped after a year during which he continued to engage in criminal activity. So they catch him again. They send him back to reform school. And then he does an apprenticeship as an electrician. He did that for a few months. And then he quit because he didn't like it. So he takes a job as a truck driver. And by this point, he's probably 18, 17, 18, 19 years old. So he takes this job as a truck driver. And then within a period of about a year, he buys his own trailer. And he finds a bank that finances the whole thing. I just can't imagine a bank financing for a 18, 19-year-old kid, I'll call him, you know, the entire trailer. So he he acts as a truck driver for about four and a half years until about 1984, where he steals a gas checkbook from the trucking firm. And this led to his first adult conviction, and he served 80 days in jail. So after he gets out, he kind of works as a sound technician for an orchestra. He sets up technical equipment for their appearances, mainly in beer tents, which I'm sure he enjoyed quite a lot. But then that didn't pan out too well for him. So he went back to work as a truck driver and he does that for a while. And then he, then he decides that he's going to steal the cargo. So he steals a load of cheese that he was hauling to Italy and he reports that he's been robbed. Well, that didn't go too well for him because he was convicted. And then he was sentenced to nine months in prison. He gets out, 
he embezzles money from somebody else and he's sentenced to another 21 months in prison. So you can see he's got this criminal background from the time he was a kid. And all of this is occurring in Germany. Yes, this is all in Germany. And so in about 1986, from 19, spring of 86 to spring of 87, he operates an investment consulting firm with his wife and a third person. Now, I'm not really sure how someone with his lack of education and his criminal background has the knowledge to, to sell investments, but I guess you don't need a whole lot of knowledge to sell investments. You just have to be kind of street smart and savvy. So he operates that for about a year. But the third person involved quits because there was money being embezzled. So then George moves on to another scam. He starts an export business to Colombia. He's going to export German items to Colombia. That didn't go too well. So then he decides to do an import business where he's going to bring diamonds from Venezuela and emeralds and bring those back to Europe. But he was not a good businessman in that either, either. So I guess he was a much better criminal than he was a businessman. He loses all of his capital. So he has a Colombian business partner. And the Colombian business partner suggests that he just, you know, hey, why don't you smuggle some cocaine back to Germany? He's going to be paid $25,000 for each kilo that he brings back to Germany. So the first thing is, the first deal is he's going to take over one kilo. And so he brings that over. And then once he gets there, he's supposed to call and say, okay, I've arrived. Who do you want me to deliver it to? He makes the call back to the person in Colombia. And the person in Colombia says, oh, you've got to sell it. So he goes around trying to sell this cocaine in smaller amounts. You know, obviously he gets arrested for that too. And so he was arrested in, I think around September the 4th of 1987. And although later on he would tell the FBI and, and some people, other people in prison that, you know, he never cooperated when he was arrested in Germany. In fact, once he was arrested, he confessed and he immediately gave up who his partners were and they, all the people that he had sold the cocaine to. But he was given a three and a half year prison sentence, which was mitigated because normally you think in Europe, they've got very strong drug laws. But he only got three and a half years because it was mitigated because he had never been convicted of a drug offense. He confessed and he really hadn't sold that much of the cocaine. So they had seized most of it. During the prison term, he was given a holiday where he gets, I guess, some time to go spend with his family. He spends a little bit of time with his family, but then he decides he's not going to go back to prison. So he leaves to come to America. And so he first came on the radar screen of U.S. law enforcement in September of 1990 when he was arrested on I-10 in Florida. How was he able to leave Germany? I'm really kind of confused how a convicted felon can get into the U.S., but I guess times are different than they were back in, in uh, the late 80s and early 90s. Well, obviously, today we've got much better computer technology than we had back then. Now, you would have thought in Germany they would have had some stop put in place that would prevent him from leaving the country, but I, I guess they didn't. But he shows up, you know, nonetheless, um, and, and gets arrested on sept in September of 1990. He was driving on I 10 like he was driving on the Autobahn in Germany. He's doing 95 in a 65 zone. So they pull him over trooper does, and they find two handguns, three Rolex watches, a little over $1,000 in cash. There's a Texas driver's license with his name on it, but there's also a German driver's license in the name of a man named Heinz Hensley. And Heinz Hensley was wanted in Germany for a major fraud where he stole about $168 million U.S. dollars, the equivalent of that. And so there was some confusion, at least initially, was he George Dudaw or was he this wanted con man fraud artist named Hein Hensley? It's interesting, too, although we didn't look at this when we were working this case a couple years later, but there was also a business card that he had that showed that he was di the director of a company called Atlantis Oil Production Corporation in Austin. And there were subscription agreements and... Uh, stock certificates where he was, or investment certificates, where obviously he was running the same scam back then for which we arrested him in 1994.
Now, what we did is, I say we, the FBI, because eventually this case gets given to the FBI, you know, we, we do a foreign police cooperation request back to Germany to try to identify, was he Heinz Hemsley or is he George Dudoff? But we send the information also to the German Federal Criminal Police, also called the BKA. It's kind of the equivalent of the FBI in Germany. And so he's in prison for a little bit of time while they try to figure out who he is and if the Germans want to extradite him back to Germany. But while he's in there, local law enforcement, the the prison guards, they've got sources obviously in the prisons. And there was a source who said that Dudoff admitted to him that he was involved in issuing bogus stock certificates on oil lease deals. And he told this source that he would fly potential investors from Germany to Austin and then give them VIP tours of offshore oil fields out in the, in the Gulf in Louisiana and off the coast of Texas. And he said that he would offer these people investments in the range of three to four hundred thousand dollars for each share. Dudoff also told the source that he had, had been involved in drug trafficking and had laundered proceeds through his company. And he actually gives the source his name and phone number and says, hey, look, if you're interested in in helping me when you get out of prison, here's my contact information. I'd love to have you. There was another prison source who also said that he had heard, overheard Dudoff talking with his attorney in Florida, and this attorney was trying to get him released from jail and not be extradited back to Germany. Uh, Dudoff told the source that the attorney told him, if you can find a woman who's expecting a baby, it might be grounds to get you released from prison, and also prevent you from being deported. And Dudoff told the source that his attorney was actively looking for a pregnant woman that they could pay who would be willing to say that Dudoff was the father. So eventually Dudoff does get sent back to Germany to serve out the remainder of his prison sentence. And so he was extradited back in March of 1991. So you can see he was in prison for several months. He was in prison for about six months before he was extradited back to Germany. So he serves out the rest of his prison sentence. And once he gets out of prison, what does he do? He returns to the land of, (laughs) exactly. He returns to the land of opportunity. Well, this guy is really a scam artist. You were just telling us about all these scams that he was talking about and trying to pull while he was in jail. I would almost describe him as a sociopath. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. My goodness. In jail, talking about you know the schemes that he's going to run once he gets out. So he, he comes back to America in May of 1993. He comes through Chicago. But his stay in America would be relatively brief because about nine months later, we would arrest him. In January of 1994, we would arrest him. And he would stay in prison for several years until he had served out his prison sentence and then he would be deported back to Germany once he had served out his prison sentence. So that kind of gives you a history of Dudoff so you can kind of get a feel for what he was like. There's another central figure in this case who played a critical role, and that was a cooperating witness. I'll call him a CW. We'll abbreviate it to CW. The role of the CW in this case was very critical. But I'll say this also. Thankfully, he wore a wire. And we consensually recorded his telephone calls because we would, there would be some problems that would develop with the source later. As you know, you know, good sources also come with sometimes bad problems. Your best sources sometimes can be the most difficult. Uh, But this police, this source was a former police officer from the St. Louis area. He had written a couple of books. One book was called Killing the Badge, and it was based on a true story about a billionaire who hires an assassin to kill crooked cops who wrongfully murdered his son. And so it was a fictional book. But again, it's based on a true story, so he says. And at the time, the CW was looking for investors in his books so he could make them into movies. I I would describe the CW as kind of a wheeler dealer. He seemed to have a lot going on. He was a person in the know about a lot of things. And he was always looking to make money. What the CW is looking to do and what Dudolph's looking to do kind of brings them together. It was a mutual friend who introduced 
the CW and Dudoff in July of 1993. And this, this mutual friend described Dudoff as a rich German looking for investments. So they didn't meet while they were in prison. No, okay. the CW was never in prison. He was a little shady. I will say that. I'm not going to give his name or anything, but he was a little shady himself. And I think that's why it was kind of a symbiotic relationship in some ways between the two of them. So it was a mutual friend that introduced them. And at the first meeting, you know, Dudoff is, was really good at, you know, listening to people and assessing what their needs were. Typical of a con man, you know, trying to figure out what do people need in their lives. And so at the first meeting, Dudoff, he tells the source that, that he owned a publishing company in Germany which was not true. But again, it's something that, that, would, that would pique the CW's interest and, and, and align him more closely with Dudoff. So Dudoff gives him his business card and says, hey, when you get a chance, stop by my office. You know, within a couple of days, uh, CW, he goes over and he meets with Dudoff and Dudoff says, hey, look, if I like your books, I'll make them into movies. But he also told the CW that he needed somebody to help his employees and keep an eye on them. So he offers the CW a job to pay him $100,000 to start working for him. So $100,000 is a lot of money. But if you think back to 1994, $100,000 back then was even more. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, kind of what, what the CW became, in some ways he became Dudolph's confidant. Dudoff was not savvy, obviously, with America and how things were done here. So, you know, the, C- the, the CW, he would tell Dudoff, you know, well, no, this is the way things are done here. But Dudoff also used him kind of as an enforcer for his employees. Because while Dudoff is running this Ponzi scheme, he's bringing over German speakers. And they're selling investments in phony oil wells to people in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. These Germans, these salesmen, they're coming over here on tourist visas. You know, they're not authorized to work. And so uh, the CW, he would help these guys get settled in America. He would, you know, help them get an apartment. He'd work with them, you know, if they got in trouble. But Dudolf, he was kind of mesmerized by the CW. And he would ask him, you know, hey, he would ask him about his prowess with a weapon. And he would ask him if he'd ever killed anyone. And Dudoff also had an associate who was named Raimondo Lopez. And Dudoff tells the CW that this associate of his, Raimondo Lopez, had been arrested in a stolen bond case and that he needed him to pay off somebody to make the case go away. And the CW, again, he was a street smarts guy. And he tells Dudoff, hey, look, you don't want to mess with the feds. And Dudoff says, well, I've already collected $27,000 to fix this case. Now, what, what the CW didn't know at the time, Dudoff was also involved in that stolen bond case. And that'll play into, you know, this murder for hire that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, because it was Raimondo Lopez that Dudoff wanted to kill. Again, it was somebody he was a co-conspirator with in, with these stolen bonds. These guys that are coming over from Germany, are they aware that this is all a scheme, that there are no oil investments? No, they're okay. not aware. And neither yeah, does I, the I CW. Inter- the CW also no. thinks that it's legitimate. Right. He thinks it's a legitimate also. Okay. Yes. Now, I, I, I interviewed you know, a couple of the salesmen. I'll talk about one here in a couple of seconds. Where, where this salesman... Dudolf, most of them were Germans that he hired, but he also hired an American. It was the American salesman that was the one that was savvy enough because, again, he knows America. He knows how things run here. He was savvy enough to make some checks and make some calls to check on these oil wells. But I'll talk about that here here in a couple of minutes. But in August of 93, Dudolf gave the CW his German passport and said that his immigration status was about to expire. And again, Dudoff came here also on a tourist visa, part of this visa waiver program. And he tells the CW that he needs him to take care of his immigration problems. But again, Dudoff's thinking this guy's a former policeman. He can, he can take care of anything. And the next month, Dudoff asked the CW, he says, look, I need you to get me a U.S. passport in my true name. He says, I can't leave the United States in return 
because of my expired visa. So that would have been in about September of 1993. And nothing more really happened on this until right after the first of the year in 1994. Now, I think probably the C, the Dudoff continued to ping the CW and ask him about getting him a passport. And the CW kept putting him off. But it was shortly after New Year's of 1994 that things really start to pick up. Early January of 1994, Dudoff gives the CW two passport photos, and they had some additional conversations. And but on January the fourth, uh, this CW, or, or at that time he was a prospective CW, he shows up at the FBI office and just walks in. I've got complaint duty that day, so complaint duty, you know, for your listeners means you know I'm assigned to. Anybody that walks in that wants to talk to an FBI agent or anybody that calls in and wants to talk to an FBI agent, whether it's to to give information on a crime or ask about applications, just whatever, that was what you did for the day. We rotated that. Everybody had complaint duty. Can I interrupt just for a second? Because I do want to keep people up to date. And I think you know that that doesn't happen anymore. Now all the calls, you know, go to a central location. I think it's in West Virginia, isn't it? It is. It is in West Virginia. Yes. But uh, you know something? Most agents hated complaint duty. Yeah. And I wouldn't say I particularly enjoyed it, but what I always, I tried to see the silver lining in things. What I saw was complaint duty was an opportunity maybe to develop informants. Absolutely. People call in, complain about things, and I actually did develop. Over the course of the time I did complaint duty, several years in the Austin office, you know, yeah, I did develop some sources from complaint duty. So I always try to look at it from that lens or that prism. Right. And also the other, the other thing is, you know, cases come into our office, the FBI office in many ways. And especially Mm -hmm. if you are, if you're a newer agent, a younger agent, You can get some really good cases just because you just happen to be the person on complaint duty. And most cases in the FBI, if a case lands on your desk, if you're able to develop a case, no matter how big it gets, if you initiated it, you get to keep it. So, yeah, there were many advantages to complaint duty. Some of the disadvantages of sending it outside the local area are starting to appear. But anyway, that's a whole sidebar. But I didn't want people to think that complaint duty uh, was the same now as it was before. So back to the story. So with, with complaint duty, like you said, when you're a new agent, you know, it, it's important. You, you're, you're interacting with the public. And so to me, it was something that I thought was, I look back now and I think it, it is important for a new agent to do that. But also when you're a new agent, a lot of times your cases come from your supervisor, you know, things that come into them, whether that's from FBI headquarters or other sources, and the supervisor assigns you a case. So you're kind of spoon fed at the beginning. But when you work in complaint duty, that's kind of the beginning of you developing your own cases. And, you know, an agent, as they mature in their careers, less and less are they spoon fed by the supervisor but they're developing their own cases from sources, contacts, liaison. So I'm sitting doing complaint duty. It was actually January the 4th when this this man walks in and he tells me this. uh, At the time, it was kind of a wild story about this man that he worked for that was involved in money laundering and fencing stolen bonds. He told me that that Dudoff had bragged about working for associates of Pablo Escobar, that he was anxious to get out of the United States to pick up eight million dollars. Dudoff had told him about his involvement in this stolen bond case and that these bonds had been stolen 20 years before. The CW is talking to me on January the 4th of 1994, kind of telling us the, the story about Dudoff and, and that Dudoff had asked him to get him an American passport in its true name. And the CW told us that it was actually just a couple of days earlier on, on New Year's Eve, December the 31st, that Dudoff had asked him if he would shoot Raimondo Lopez. And the CW said, no. And Dudoff said, well, you've shot people before. I'll pay you whatever it takes. Dudoff also mentioned to the CW that there was a man named Roman Blattner, who was a cocaine dealer, wanted for fur- forgery in Germany that he wanted taken off the streets. And the CW did tell us that the Dudoff was bringing over German speakers and selling investments in oil wells to people in Europe. 
and like I say, I have to admit, I was a little incredulous because this seems like a pretty wild story. I mean, when you're working complaint duty, you get a wide variety of people that come in. Some are as lucid as you and I, but others can be, you know, can have some mental problems and kind of be a little bit crazy. And so, you know, my first, you know, I listened to him. I thanked him. I said, look, you know, let give me a few days and let me get back in contact with you. Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of information to process. And, you know, I've got to verify or try to corroborate you know, you some skeptical? of the information. I was. I was. I was a little incredulous because, again, it just seemed too wild. It was just too much. You know, you want me to kill somebody. He wants you to get him a U.S. passport. He's selling investments. And again, the, the CW didn't know that it was fraud. But how can a guy running an oil business want somebody killed and, you know, want to buy a U.S. passport? So at the beginning, you know, I, I reached out to INS to check his status and confirm that he was here and when he came in. I did a check through the FBI records and I determined that, yes, Raimondo Lopez had been arrested by the FBI. Reached out to the U.S. Attorney's Office to talk to them to explain, you know, this is what I've gotten. You know, is this something that maybe if we can prove that you would be interested in, in prosecuting? Again, the murder for hire, that would not be a federal crime. That's a state crime. But definitely the passport violation. Didn't know about the fraud yet. But the passport, you know, trying to bribe a government official to get a passport, yes, that would be a federal criminal offense. So when I reach out to the U.S. Attorney's Office, yes, they're interested, but they also told me that the Internal Revenue Service, their criminal investigation division, so not the revenue agents, but the criminal investigators at the IRS, they had actually received information on Dudoff that he was possibly involved in money laundering. So now, you know, I open up the investigation. Now it's a joint investigation. It's not just the FBI. I've got IRS CID, IRS Criminal Investigation Division. I've got them on board with us. As you know, some of the best cases in the FBI and a lot of our cases are worked as joint investigations. My dad used, my dad's a retired policeman and he used to tease me and say, yeah, I know how you FBI guys are. FBI, we'll take it from here. You know, I used to laugh and say, oh, that's not the way it is, Dad. You know that. And he would laugh. He was just teasing me. And that kind of parallels, you know, the chapter in your book where you talked about the FBI doesn't play well with others, that myth that's out there. Yes. And, you know, I never saw that in my 28 years with the FBI. I never saw that the FBI didn't play well with others. We always played well with others. I mean, for me, some of my best cases were those joint investigations. So I've got the CW that came in, you know, I start corroborating his information, talked to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and it was on January the 10th of 1994 that I opened this case, again, as a joint investigation with the IRS criminal investigators. So meet with the source again, start developing kind of the strategy plan, what we're looking to do. On January the 13th, Dudoff called the CW at his house and asked him if he was home. And the CW says, yes, I'm home. And, the C and, and Dudoff says, great, I'm sitting right in front of your house. The CW, for, for whatever, I, I think he didn't trust Dudoff completely. And the CW said he would never allow Dudoff to come into his house. And so the CW goes out to his car and sits in the car. And Dudoff told the CW, says, hey, I'm in bad shape. I got to get this U.S. passport. I need to go to Zurich to pick up $4 million and Peru to pick up another $8 million. And Dudoff told the CW, he says, if I don't get that passport, I'm as good as dead. I have to ask you this question, because how in the world is a German national going to get a U.S. passport? What, so what if he has two passport photos? What's the story? Where's the birth certificate? Where's all the other documentations that you need in order to get a passport? Well, he's not looking to get one legitimately as you and I would. He's looking to bribe someone, to have the CW bribe someone to get him a passport in his true name. He knows he can't get one legitimately. But again, he's got this man that works for him. That's a former law enforcement officer that knows how things work and can get things done. So he expects the CW to know somebody that he can bribe to get him that U.S. passport. Wow. And the CW, he, he was savvy. The CW was extremely savvy and street smart. So to pacify Dudoff, he goes back in his house and, and he prints off a blank application. 
and takes it out to Dudoff and has Dudoff sign it. Like that would make a difference. But, but what he does is he tells Dudoff, he says, hey, I need you to sign this so the passport office will have your signature. Again, that doesn't get Dudoff a passport. Dudoff doesn't know that or doesn't figure it out, but it puts, it puts Dudoff off for a little bit. And during this meeting also, Dudoff tells the CW that he, he asked the CW, you know, how are your plans going to kill Raimondo Lopez? And the CW says, well, my friend's not in town yet, but should be here next week. Well, why does Dudoff want Raimondo Lopez killed? And I think that when Dudoff was unable to fix Lopez's case, remember he asked the CW to try to fix the case to get it dropped. I think when Dudoff was unable to fix that case, he knows he's also part of the conspiracy. So he's looking to kill Raimondo Lopez so he's not implicated in that stolen bond case. So that's a meeting on the 13th. This case has so many twists and turns to it. Just amazing that you have this one guy that is involved in so many different types of violations from, you know, drugs to white collar crime to scams to attempted murder. It's it's just wild. This is a very bad dude. He was crooked. He was crooked as all get out. So I'm also, you know, I'm working with the source, but I'm also following other investigative avenues. And I find really through the source. You know, he recommends a former employee that I should talk to. And this was an American. And so I reach out to this former employee as a little hesitant because I'm thinking, you know, I don't know, is he still connected with Dudoff? I don't think so. But, but it's one of those things you say, well, look, I, you know, I need to develop the case. I've got to get more evidence, more information. We're going to take a chance. So I go out and literally just show up at the former employee's house. You know, I took another agent with me and he invites me in. And we sit down and we talk and the employee, he talks about the sales process. And he said that the investors were promised a return of 2% a month. So when you think about that, that's 24% a year return. And there's the old adage, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. We know that as investigators, but the public doesn't always know that. You know, again, you got these people in Germany who think they're investing in American oil wells. They've probably seen the TV show Dallas. They shouldn't remember J.R. Ewing from that show, but, but nonetheless, they think they're investing in these Texas oil wells. And didn't you say that he also would bring them over and give them a VIP tour of oil wells? Yes. We'll talk about that. Yes. Okay. So I'm talking to the salesman, and he told me that you know, after a while, he's wondering himself, you know, do I need a license to sell these investments? So he asked the office manager what the office manager tells him. The office manager says, no, you know, as long as you're selling investments internationally, you don't need a license. So he's not satisfied. He's still a little suspicious. And so he starts reaching out to agencies in Louisiana, in Alabama to ask about these oil wells. And what he finds out is, you know, I guess each oil well has a coordinate of where it's located. And it's not latitude and longitude because the numbers don't match up that way, but, but there's some meaning to them. So, you know, he's got the coordinate of where this oil well is supposed to be in Louisiana. But when he calls whatever the agency is there that's responsible for overseeing oil wells and drilling, What he finds out is the coordinate he has doesn't match up to the location where that oil well is supposed to be. He reaches out to Alabama because there was supposed to be a a First Eagle Oil Production Company. That was Dudoff's company name, First Eagle Oil Production Company. Reaches out to the Alabama authorities about this, about a First Eagle project there. And what he finds out is where this oil well is supposed to be, that that field was actually owned by Murphy Oil and Gas and that there have been no new permits issued there since 1982. And he said he worked at the company for about three to four weeks total time before he was fired for not being aggressive enough. He said he really thought he was fired because he asked too many questions. And so I also reached out to the appropriate authorities in Louisiana and Alabama to corroborate what that salesman had told me, and they confirmed to me that that salesman's information was in fact true. 
So, you know, at the time, you know, as we're doing this, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I may do a search later on. It's a business and it is home. So I need to start developing evidence that I could put into a search warrant. So the investigation, it expands. We, again, we've got a lot going on. I'm working with IRS CID. They also have a source who was a current employee at the company. Their source told them that confirmed that Dudoff was bringing in over salesmen, you know, German speakers. They were selling investments in oil wells for $10,000 a share. He said they would cold call these people in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. They would have phone books and they would just cold call these people. And, you know, once they get them on the line, you know, if they showed any interest at all, they'd send them a prospectus. And then they would, you know, tell them the anticipated rates of return and told them that they would be guaranteed a return of 2% a month, which was important because that also validated what that other salesman had told me. The source said that, you know, when he first started at First Eagle, you know, he believed in the company. He believed in what Dudoff was selling. But he said after a while that he started to become suspicious. He said, especially after they took a trip to Louisiana. And there was a German accountant that Dudoff was trying to woo to become a representative for, for First Eagle Oil in Germany. And so Dudoff brings her over. There's an oil man from Dallas that comes down. This employee, the source of the IRS, they all go to Louisiana. So they bring in this, this German accountant. They take her to Louisiana. They, they, they fly by private jet over to Lafayette, Louisiana, and then they drive around and look at oil wells. And what the IRS source said was, it was interesting that they would drive around to look at oil wells, but they never stopped. All Dudoff would say, well, that's First Eagle 31. That's such and such project there. And the CW said the fact that they didn't stop to actually walk on the, the property, you know, look at the rigs or, or the drilling platforms, he said that's really got him suspicious. And he said that by, by December, so again, this is January, he said it was probably mid-December that he was convinced the products they were selling were not legitimate. He said that he would get calls from investors complaining that they didn't receive their guaranteed payments, their guaranteed returns. But he said Dudoff would tell the salesman that their, their investors didn't send the money in, and so he wasn't going to pay him a commission. Well, really what Dudoff was doing, he was pocketing some of that sales, the, the, those sales profits and not telling the salesman to deny them their commissions. And the reason he could get away with that was there was a lot of turnover in the sales department. And so when there's a lot of turnover, these guys weren't always sticking around long enough to be able to claim their commissions. Hmm. So again, I'm getting information from a current employee that's paralleling or corroborating information from a former employee. You were saying that uh, Dudoff was starting to pocket some of these investments. What type of a lifestyle was he living? He had a nice lifestyle. He lived in a nice house in Northwest Austin, probably worth, of, at the time in 1994, worth about $350,000 that he was renting. He drove a Mercedes S500, bought his girlfriend a Mercedes. Those two cars, those two Mercedes, he used investor funds of about $135,000 to buy just those two cars. You know, so he lived a, a nice lifestyle. He had a girlfriend that, you know, he paid for everything that she did, everything that she wanted. As far as the Ponzi scheme, he raised a, about $2.3 million. We didn't find that he spent any money to try to drill a well. You know, he just pocketed, spent all of that money. So by this time, you know, you've got the source being pressured to get dude off a passport reach out to the diplomatic security service of the State Department. State Department, they have what are the equivalent of 1811 investigators or series 1811 investigators that what they do is they do investigations for the State Department, but they also provide diplomatic protection for certain government officials. You know, you have secret service that do the heads of state, but there are other people that are not heads of state that need diplomatic protection and so the Bureau of Diplomatic Service, or what's called the Diplomatic Security Service out of the State Department, they provide those protections for those people. Also, they work as regional security officers at embassies and consulates around the world. 
know, at first I wasn't too sure about the, the passport violation. I was more focused on the murder for hire. So it was actually the IRS CID agent that I was working with. He's the one that said, Mike, we really need to work this piece. It, you know, let's bring on board the DSS, the Diplomatic Security Service. And, you know, I'm glad he convinced me of that because, you know, that was the right thing to do. They, they became a great partner in this investigation. They're kind of a little known agency, but they do a lot of great work. And, and they've got the, the primary responsibility for investigating passport fraud. And again, that would turn out to be one of the, the most interesting pieces of the case. So, you know, here we are, the, you know, January the 15th, the CW calls Dudoff, because again, Dudoff's putting pressure on him, and, and, and the CW calls Dudoff on January the 15th and says, hey, I went to Houston, but I didn't take any money with me. And my passport contact, he wants $30,000 to get you that passport. And the Dudolf, Dudolf says, hey, come over to my house and let's talk about it. And again, Dudolf lived in this upscale neighborhood. He had a, a four-bedroom, red brick house, less than two years old. Uh, the CW gets over there. And I looked up the weather on that day. That day in Austin, the high was 60 degrees, but it had dropped to the upper 40s, low 50s in the evening. So the CW gets over there in the evening and you know goes up, knocks on Dudolf's door. And Dudolf puts on his coat and says, hey, let's walk around the block. I kind of vision this very mafia-esque type walk where, you know, you've got Dudoff walking around with a CW and they're talking, kind of like the mafia would do in New York. But while they walk around the block, again, I'm already working with the Diplomatic Security Service, and they had loaned us a passport, a blank U.S. passport. It doesn't have Dudoff's picture in it. It doesn't have any writing in it, but it's something the CW can show Dudoff. And so while they're walking around, CW shows it to Dudoff and says, hey, look, this hasn't been completed or sealed. But this is what I'm going to be able to get for you. And I can tell you this, Jerry, you cannot imagine the amount of security and coverage we had in that area because that's a blank U.S. passport. This is pre-9-11 by many, many years, pre-9-11, but still terrorism was a consideration. And so to be able to hand somebody a blank U.S. passport, you got to make sure that you're going to get that back. That thing cannot walk. We had instructed the CW that he had to get that passport back. He can show it to Dudoff, let him look at it, but he had to get it back. So you're covering this entire thing. Is this also being recorded? Yes. Pretty much every meeting we did with Dudoff or every phone call, every one of those was recorded. Even that initial one where Dudoff showed up at his house and they sat in the car, was that recorded? Yes, CW had a recorder at home. Okay. We'd right. given him one to keep. Yes, absolutely. And thankfully, we'll talk a little bit later about problems with the source, but thankfully every one of those meetings was recorded. So they walk around the block, CW shows them this blank passport, and then they go back to Dudoff's house. But while they're walking, the CW tells Dudoff, he says, look, this is something that only somebody who works at a passport office can get you and tells him that his contact works for the federal government and he's not going to do it for nothing. He wants $30,000. When they get back to Dudoff's house, Dudoff actually completes that passport application that he had signed for the source. The source still had that and took it back to Dudoff's house or had it in his car. So when they get back to the house, CW gets that passport application out of his car and Dudoff fills it out. He completes and he lists his date of birth. You know, it's, it's February the 6th, 1960. He said he was born in Munich. He gives his father's name as Georgie Dudoff. And this is key. He falsely stated that his father was born in New York. That's, you know, part of the fraud. That's, that's his connection, how he thinks he can get a U.S. passport is he's going to lie on the application. That's one part. He doesn't list a social security number because he actually uses two different social security numbers. And so he tells the CW, I'll call you and let you know which one, which number to use. It was also with that meeting that Dudoff gives the CW a check for $30,000 for the passport. And he tells the CW, he says, look, I need to travel to Switzerland to obtain sufficient funds to cover this check. But once I get there, I'll wire the money to your bank account so you can pay, you know, your friends at the passport office. Now, in a real case, nobody's going to want a paper trail. I mean, who would really take a check? 
probably in this case, only the government in an undercover operation would be willing to take a check. (laughs) (laughs) Especially if you have to produce what you're selling ahead of time. So he would have already had the support by then. Uh, I'll owe you. (laughs) (laughs) So to sweeten the deal, he gives the CW the title for his girlfriend's Mercedes. Not his 500 series Mercedes, but his girlfriend's, I think it was a C280 Mercedes that she had. But at this meeting, the Dudoff the also brings up the murder for hire again and asks the CW, hey, how is that progressing? And the CW says, well, hey, look, my friend wants $30,000 for that. After the meeting, the CW calls Dudoff a couple hours later and says, hey, look, my contact at the passport office, he's uncomfortable with taking a check. He doesn't want to do it, but I'll tell you what, give him the title to your 500 Mercedes, 500 S series, you know, give him some additional collateral. The dude all says, okay, fine, come get it tomorrow. CW calls him back again. He says, well, my contact, he's still not satisfied. He wants to take possession of your Mercedes and hold it until you give him the money. At this point, dude all says, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I want the passport, but I'm not giving up my Mercedes. But again, I'll give you the title to it tomorrow. And that's what we ended up doing was taking the title to his his series 500 Mercedes. But again, once once Dudoff completed that passport application, he was he's hounded the CW nonstop. You know, February, um, January the 17th, you know, the, it's getting so much pressure on January the 17th. The CW tells Dudoff that the passport was almost ready, but the office was closed for the federal holiday, which would be Martin Luther King holiday. And that when the machines turned back on, that his contact would affix the seal to the passport and bring it over. And so that was the 17th. We spent the 18th working on like search warrant affidavits, planning the arrest scenario and the takedown. Again, we're working with the Department of uh, State Department's Diplomatic Security Service. They're working on an arrest plan because they've got primary responsibility for the passport fraud. And they prepare an undercover operation plan, a, a takedown plan, arrest plan. And they name, this is so fitting, Jerry, they name the, their undercover case Operation Worst Fest. And I thought that was so appropriate because it truly was going to be a worst fest for Dudoff. <laughs> I like that. Surely, what we were looking, we're thinking about doing was doing a, a by walk with the passport. You know, get this passport prepared for Dudoff, put his picture on it, meet with him, sell him the passport, and then let him walk with it. Because by that point, we had, we still hadn't worked out the murder for hire, and we were thinking that Dudoff probably wanted the passport to leave the country after the murder for hire. But again, when you think about the amount of security and coverage we would have to keep in place between the time we gave him the passport and we had the meeting for the murder for hire, it's just there was no way to really do that because he just can't take the chance of Dudoff, you know, leaving the country, leaving Austin with the passport. So, you know, Austin, small office. Today they've got like four or five squads in an ASAC, but in 1994 we had two squads and two supervisors. So to be able to provide 24 seven coverage was just something we didn't want to have to do. So we decided that we would go ahead and we'd do the meeting on the murder for hire. And then we do the passport later on. So it was on January the 19th that we decided to meet with Dudoff and bring in an undercover Texas department of public safety officer as the CW's friend, as the hit man from St. Louis the undercover DPS officer. He was an African-American male and he looked the part. He looked like a bad guy. He really did. And he really dressed to the part too. And in this meeting, you know, he represented himself as a, a guy that would be a hitman. You know, when the meeting was over, I remember laughing, telling him, man, you were so convincing. I thought you were a hitman. The CW takes the hitman to Dudoff's office to meet with him. And Dudoff, he was so uneasy and he was actually agitated during the meeting because he was meeting the hitman. He talked in code, refusing to say Raimondo Lopez's name or what he wanted done. He he talked around it. And what Dudoff eventually said was, look, I'll pay you $5,000 today and I'll pay you $5,000 when it, 
again, he doesn't say what it is on in the meeting, but he says when it is done. And again, he, he's not happy he's meeting the hitman in person. He didn't expect that. And he went on to say, he says, I'm making statements to two people I really don't know. He says, this is something I would talk about with somebody I've known for 20 years. And he tells the hitman, the UC, the undercover and the CW, he says, look, you know, you could be from the FBI. You could be someone else. Oh, yeah. And then he looks. Yeah, because not only are we recording this, we also have a transmitter so we can hear it. We're sitting outside in a parking lot and we can hear the conversation during this meeting. A dude off looks at the CW and he says, I didn't want to meet anybody. Mm-hmm. And so they talk some more. And again, they talk around the hit and, you know, dude off's not willing to make a decision right then. And he says, look, you know, he, he looks at the CW and says, you know, says, look, I need to think about it. Also at that meeting on the 19th, the CW gives dude off a copy of his passport, like a photostatic copy. So we'd already, the, the diplomatic security service, they had completed a passport for dude off and made a photostatic copy that the CW is able to give to Dudoff. So Dudoff now sees that he's got a passport. Doesn't have the passport yet, but he has a copy of it. He knows what it's going to look like. And he looked at that. When, when the CW gave it to him, he looked at it intently and got a broad, got a, a, a broad smile on his face. It's like he could taste that money. He knew that it, the passport was coming soon and you know that money would soon be on its way. So again, that's on the 19th of January. Later that evening, the CW goes over to Dudoff's home. When he gets there, he finds out Dudoff's mother is in town. Dudoff's stepfather is in town. So it's more than just Dudoff. And actually, Dudoff and his stepfather were out in the garage working on a car. And Dudoff has no problem talking in front of his stepfather. And he chastises the CW about introducing him to the hitman. And he rhetorically asked the CW, he says, do you know how much time you get when you hire a killer? And that he reiterated he was not expecting to meet the hitman, didn't want to meet him, and that he wanted the CW to handle everything. He says all of this in front of his stepfather? In front of his stepfather, who spoke English. But he and the CW, the stepfather and the, C- and the CW, they had conversed a little bit in the garage about the car. So the stepfather obviously spoke and understood English. And he had, Dudoff had no qualms about discussing this in front of his stepfather. So Dudoff, Dudoff also expresses frustration about the passport. He's not gotten the passport already. And he tells the CW he's already had to cancel meetings twice and says, hey, look, I'm talking serious money with people in Europe. They've been waiting a week for me with money at home. And they're scared about keeping it there. And then he goes back to the, the murder for hire again. He tells the CW, he says, look, I haven't known you for that long. And he tells the CW, he says, look, you know, you could possibly be an FBI agent. Astonishingly, Jerry, the CW replies, well, I used to be. You know that. So he tells him, I used to be an FBI agent, the CW. Why did he say that? I have no idea, Jerry. My head about hit the roof of the car when I heard that. But it gets worse than that. Uh Not only does he say, I used to be, and you know that, he says, you know what we call the FBI? Fumbling bunch of idiots. (laughs) Are you serious? I am serious. It's on a tape. It's still on tape. Yeah, that you may have to use in a court setting. Okay. In a couple of minutes, I'll tell you, that statement gets a lot worse. Uh Uh-oh. But yeah, it it does. And and Dudo says, well, look, you know, I need to think about it. Let me sleep on it. And, you know, I'll let you know tomorrow if I want to, if I want to move forward with that project. That's how Dudo phrased it, that project. So on the morning of January the 20th, uh, the CW, again, we're taping these conversations. He calls Dudo and he asks if his friend has a job. To which Dudo says no. And the CW says, well, hey, my friend's not happy. He's been in Austin for a few days. He's wasting his time. He's spending his money. And so what Dudolf agreed to do was to get, pay the man $2,000 for his expenses. And he wrote a check, a First Eagle Oil Production Company check. He makes it payable to the CW for $2,000. And in the memo section, the lower left-hand corner, he wrote travel expenses. 
And again, Dudoff reiterated to him in that phone call. He says, look, CW calls him by name. He says, look, I didn't want to see anybody. Dudoff was not criminally charged on the state level with attempted murder for hire or conspiracy. The federal charges were going to be much stronger and the state, you know, they weren't interested in pursuing it. They, they declined prosecution just, you know, again, citing that the, the federal charges that we had that we were soon to bring. We'd also decided that that day, January the 20th, would be the day we were going to do the undercover meeting with the allegedly corrupt passport employee, passport clerk, who was going to get the payoff, who was going to give dude off his passports. Again, we knew we, we couldn't let him leave with it. So we were going to give it to Dudoff and then arrest him as soon as you give him the passport. Can't imagine the amount of planning that went into that takedown. Some agencies, they might write their arrest plans on the back of a napkin and not do a lot of planning. But I can tell you that, you know, that's not how the FBI operates. And that certainly wasn't how the diplomatic security service operated either. You're looking at contingencies. What ha- you know? What we're going to do if this happens? What if that happens? Got code words for the undercover agent to use if they feel they're in danger. So there's a tremendous amount of planning that goes in to those. Early on the 20th, CW called dude off and says, "Hey, the passport's on its way." And a few hours later, the CW went to meet Dudoff's office, and you know, first thing Dudoff says is, "Has it arrived?" He says, Dudoff told him, he says, I paid $10,000 for flight arrangements and I need that passport today. So, you know, we've got everything set up operationally. We've got the diplomatic security service undercover employee. He's in town briefing him on the plan, uh, finalizing the search warrant affidavits on the 20th. And what we ultimately decided to do is we were going to meet that evening. We're going to set up the undercover meeting that evening at a post office to about 10 minutes from where. Dudoff lived. Mid late afternoon, I get my search warrant affidavits. They're signed off on, so we're good to go, ready to do the searches once we arrest Dudoff. So it was about 7 p.m. that the CW called Dudoff and told him he had his passport and told him to meet him at the post office. So you've got the CW and the undercover. They're sitting in a car waiting for Dudoff to arrive, and we're sitting in the area close by to provide coverage. But the few minutes we waited for Dudoff to get there seemed so much longer because you were just anticipating this meeting and this plan arrest. You know, we had a couple of times where you'd have lights pull into the parking lot and you know, everybody would be ready. But those are just cars coming in to mail letters. And so we had to wait. But eventually we saw Dudoff's 500 series Mercedes slowly enter the parking lot. It was a cool, rainy evening. It was probably 50s, upper 40s, but it had been raining that day. Dudoff gets out of his car, walks over, gets in the passenger seat in the front of the CW's vehicle. You've got the undercover State Department employee in the back seat, and of course the CW is in the driver's seat. The undercover State Department employee gives, you know, reaches up front, he hands Dudoff the passport, and he explains to Dudoff, he says, you know, hey, look, I'm a State Department passport agency employee, and I'm taking a risk here. I could go to jail. And Dudoff said, well, I've got an expired visa. I'm going to have trouble getting back into the U.S. And the U.C. told him, he says, look, you know, I don't like taking a check. And before he could even finish that phrase, Dudoff interrupted him and said, look, I need to go to Switzerland. Look, when I return, you'll have that money in greenbacks. And during the meeting, Dudoff also alleges that or alludes that he had served time in prison. But he also tells the undercover agent that he had a friend in Germany. Probably this man, Heinz Hensley, is who we think it was, that also wanted a U.S. passport. The undercover State Department employee, he reiterated the risk he was taking and he was violating the people's trust. And Dudoff acknowledged that. You know, kind of said, uh huh, uh huh. I'll do that one for 50. The next one I want $50,000 for, but anything after that, it'll be $30,000 for each additional passport. Dudoff actually looks at the CW and tells the CW, he says, look, when I get back from Germany, I'm going to give you a $10,000 bonus for getting me this passport. <laughs> so the CW, man, he played that up. So he did do that well. He did play that up very well. How excited he would be once he got that $10,000 bonus. So we give dude off the passport. And when he exits the vehicle, he's arrested along with the CW and along with the undercover. Now, once dude off is transported from the scene, we get dude off in cuffs. 
check him to make sure he doesn't have anything on him that's dangerous. We search him, put him in a car. He leaves. Once Dudoff leaves and is out of sight, obviously we release the undercover and the CWs. Just for the benefit of the audience, you know, a lot of times in these undercover operations, you do arrest the undercover agent at the same time. You don't want the subject to know that it was an undercover operation for leverage purposes. Because, you know, you can go back to the office and when you're, when you're interviewing, if, if the subject consents to an interview, when you're interviewing him or her, you can say, hey, you know, we arrested your friend. And this is what they told us. They told us X, Y, or Z. So it's important when you do these takedowns is you want to arrest, and I use that with air quotes, arrest the, the CW if he's the, he or she are there as well as the undercover. One thing about this arrest, it's what's called a probable cause arrest or a warrantless arrest because we didn't have an arrest warrant for Dudoff. And I think many agents go through their careers and maybe they never make a, a warrantless arrest because generally the FBI, we're doing our investigations and making our arrests after the crimes have been committed. But in this case, you know, we didn't have an arrest warrant because you know, again, we, we didn't have the exchange between Dudoff and the undercover with the passport. And so working with the prosecutor, the prosecutor was comfortable, you know, with you know certain scenario of Dudoff says this and this is what happens. And, you know, I'll authorize this warrantless arrest. And in this case, once we gave Dudoff the passport, we couldn't let him leave with it. And he had committed a crime in the presence of a federal officer. This diplomatic security service case agent on their side was a man named Robert Starnes. And so after the arrest took place, he pretty much stayed up almost the whole night putting together the affidavit to get the arrest warrant. And the next morning, he went before a U.S. magistrate and secured an arrest warrant for Dudoff for violation of 18 U.S.C. 1546 fraud and misuse of visas, permits, and related documents and false impersonation. Did you have enough evidence in order to put together an affidavit for an arrest warrant for the investment fraud? Not yet. No, not yet, because we didn't have financial records uh, from any of the investors. You know, by this point, we obviously knew that he was selling these oil wells that, you know, he was selling investments in oil wells he didn't own, but we didn't have any investors identified. And we didn't have any overt acts, you know, as far as we didn't have phone records from the company. We didn't have any investors records that showed where they sent, used DHL or wire transferred the money because it just happened so quickly. We didn't have time yet to get that information. So, no, we didn't have enough for an arrest warrant yet on a wire fraud or a mail fraud charge. But, Jerry, the undercover diplomatic security service agent that night was unbelievable. You know, he represented himself to be this corrupt passport agency clerk. But what's funny is he looked more like a college or NFL linebacker. He was a big guy. Before he was with the Diplomatic Security Service, he was a Texas Department of Public Safety state trooper. And he was no stranger to danger. He previously worked at the U.S. Embassy in Somalia as the regional security officer and saved the life of an embassy employee while he was dodging rocket propelled grenades in the process. But his heroism would become more evident in 1995 when he was assigned to Bosnia Herzegovina. A little more than a year after this undercover meeting, he's working in Bosnia. And in August of 1995, he's traveling to Sarajevo in an armored personnel carrier. And he's escorting the American ambassador named Robert Frazier and other diplomats to a meeting. And while they're driving in this armored personnel carrier, they're driving on mountainous roads, and the road gave way. And this vehicle tumbled down a 500-meter mountain. Three Americans, including the ambassador and a French soldier, were killed. But in spite of his own injuries, our undercover, he attempted to rescue other passengers from that burning vehicle and provide first aid. I mean, it's just unbelievable what he did. There was a big article in in the Washington Post about you know, specifically about the undercovers. I don't have a problem giving his name because he's long retired now. His name was Pete Hargraves. And, you know, I cannot say, I mean, he did an awesome job that night, but his heroism and his service to the U.S. government is something that I think everybody should admire. Let's make sure that you get me the link to that. And I'll actually include that in the show notes for this episode. 
that would be great because again, I mean, his heroism is, you know, second to none. Oh yeah. So, you know, it's kudos to him. Back to the case. We arrest Dudoff. We take him back to the FBI office for processing and he agrees to talk to us. And he pretty much confessed to everything. You know, during the interview, he talked about Raimondo Lopez and fraudulent deals in Europe. He talked about the stolen bonds. He admitted that he had told the CW to take to kill Lopez and that the CW had located a hitman from St. Louis. And Dudoff says, but I decided not to kill Lopez. But he admitted to, you know, giving him $2,000 for expenses. He talked about First Eagle Oil Production Company. You know, that he had, he had that, it'd been in operation for about eight months. And that he worked with a man out of Dallas named Bill Brasso. And I want to talk just briefly about Brasso in case I forget at the end. But Brasso was a guy in Dallas that supposedly drilled oil wells. But really, Brasso was doing the same thing that Dudoff was doing. He was running fictitious investment scams. In fact, after Dudoff got arrested, unbeknownst to me, Brasseau reaches out to several of the investors and says, hey, look, I can finish this oil well. Dudoff's already paid me $400,000. I can finish the oil well, but I need another $200,000 to finish it. So several of the investors put in another $200,000, give it to Brasseau, and guess what? Brasseau doesn't drill anything. He just rips them off. But it, the Dallas office worked that case. The Dallas FBI office worked that case, and they arrested Brousseau and convicted him of fraud. So again, these people get ripped off a second time. Some of them do. Dudoff, he admitted that he had promised the investors a rate of return of about 2% and said that he had paid those returns from incoming money from new investors. Talked about that he had spent about $135,000 to buy those Mercedes vehicles, but he tried to justify it by saying that he needed them to chaperone investors around when they came into town. We asked him about the money he was supposedly going to pick up, and he said, well, the $8 million in Peru, he says, I really need my computer to explain it to you, but he said that the money originated from East Germany and was connected to the Nazis in World War II. I don't know if any of that's true or not. In fact, at the time in 1994, there was no more East Germany because the Berlin Wall had already fallen. Um, We interviewed Dudoff three more times, but the interviews were pretty much worthless. The information he provided was, I think, was just enough to make us think he was trying to cooperate. But he never really implicated any narcotics traffickers that he associated with. He would give us names of people that allegedly wanted to launder money through him, but it was just kind of far-fetched. There was one guy, I won't give his name in case he, it's a legitimate person, but he said this guy wanted to launder $50 million through his company. And this guy was from Germany. We interview him, take him, drop him off at the, at the um, actually at that time we had to drop him off at the, the, the county jail because uh, the marshal's office wasn't open. Once he has his magistrate hearing, he was remanded into custody. They did not release him on bond because he was a flight risk and he had the allegations of the murder for hire, what he was trying to do. Uh, He was indicted on February the 15th, 1994 for bribery of a public official, fraud and misuse of visas, permits and related documents, and then procurement of citizenship for naturalization unlawfully. It's kind of fitting, I guess, in a way. Dudoff initially hires an attorney out of Dallas named Robert Rose. But he surely had to find a new attorney because Robert Rose resigned his law license in lieu of disciplinary action. It's like, how do these crooks find each other? You've got (laughs) Duda, Heinz Hensley, Bill Brusso, Robert Rose. It seems like there's this, it's a small world in the criminal underworld. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, like minds. After his arrest, we execute two search warrants. We do a search warrant at Dudoff's home. Didn't really get much there. We got some financial records, mainly personal checking accounts. But the business, that's where we really got a lot of the financial records. We found investment records that identified all of the investors, where they lived, contact information for them, how much they invested. Once we get that, we start working on the investment fraud and the Ponzi scheme. I mean, today, I think everybody knows what a Ponzi scheme is. Bernie Madoff, you got the Allen Stanford case from, from Houston. But back then, in 1994, Ponzi scheme by that name wasn't as common, or at least in Austin, it wasn't. But I remember trying to explain what the fraud was. Well, the fraud is you got new money coming in to pay previous investors their promised returns. 
Once Dudoff is arrested, I arrest CID and I, we start working on the Ponzi scheme. From the first Eagle salesman word spread to the investors about Dudoff's arrest. And we were contacted by this German accountant who worked with Dudoff. Her name was Hydran Berner. In fact, she was listed on the investment prospectus as a reference for the company. And initially, we weren't sure if she was involved in the crime or if she was duped by Dudoff. And Berner told us, that, in fact, she was getting ready to travel to Dallas in early February to meet with Bill Brousseau to try to work with him on finding a way to salvage the investor's money. So I got permission from the Dallas field offices to travel up to Dallas to interview her. Myself and an IRS CID D agent, we drove up to Dallas and actually met her at a restaurant in, an, in a hotel near the airport. So what she said that in, in January of 1993, she was introduced to Dudoff by one of her clients. And Dudoff had actually traveled to Frankfurt to meet her. And he explained to her that he was in the oil business in America and wanted to hire her to help get his books in order so he could legally do business in Germany. And not surprisingly, he asked her if she had any clients who might be interested in investing, but she was smart enough to say, hey, look, I don't know enough about your company. So Dudoff invites her to come to Austin. So in July of 93, she had traveled to Austin to learn more about the company. And he tells her that his first project, it was already pumping, and then he was raising money for a second project. She asked to see the books and records, and he only gives her the checks that he had written. Didn't give, me, give her any money, didn't give her any information about, you know, investor money or money that he had raised. And that should have been a red flag for her. But it was during that visit to Austin that they traveled over to Louisiana, that I mentioned that a little bit earlier, that uh, with the salesman, the salesman, Dudoff, Bill Brusso, they fly over to Louisiana and they drive around. She told us they drove around for an hour and a half and Dudoff pointed out the wells that he owned. Okay, um, this, that was the drive-by. They never got out of the car. Exactly. They never got out of the car. And again, that should have been another red flag. But the, the accountant told us that after she traveled to Louisiana, she thought everything looked good and that she took the investment brochures back to Germany. I think she was just this young accountant that was naive and easily persuaded by this suave con man, George Dudoff. What was kind of interesting, this is kind of a funny story, a funny aspect of the case. While we're talking to her, she says, you know, tomorrow, Bill Brousseau and I, we're going to drive to Louisiana to see the well. So the IRS CID agent and I, we said, okay, great. We'd like to go too. <laughs> so I would love to have been a fly on the, the windshield, inside the windshield of that car to hear the conversation because, you know, at the time we didn't know it, but Brousseau was a con man himself. And here he is driving, I don't know, three hours to Louisiana with two FBI agents following him in the car. Who did she say you were? Oh, we told him. We were with the FBI. We came up to interview this accountant, and she says, you're going to Louisiana to see a well we want to go to. You have oh. a problem with that? What could he say? He can't say no. And so he says, no, I don't have a problem. Yeah, follow us. You have no idea that he is a con man. And I guess it worked. The fact that he said, yes, come along, made you think, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, we had no idea. We thought he was a legitimate driller. But much like the other trips to Louisiana, when we get there, you know, he pulls up near a well, and we st he stands outside the car telling us all about it. Never goes up to the platform. You would think if he was the one drilling this well, the people there would know who he was. Again, we, we stand beside the cars and he explains to this accountant about how it's being drilled and what the equipment was. And we sit there and talk for about 30 minutes, I don't, know, I don't know, 15 to 30 minutes. And then we get back in the cars and after that, they go back to Dallas and the IRS CID agent and I, you know, we drove to Houston. For so was a good con man, much like Dudoff, never appeared nervous around us at all. You know, I tell you, I've, I've interviewed a lot of con men. I never met one that was not likable. They have broad knowledge on a lot of topics, and they're all engaging. Again, that's what makes them successful. Several of the investors, they travel to Austin to meet with us. So again, you got these German, Swiss, and Austrian investors. There were several of them that traveled to Austin on their own dime, on their own money to meet with us. Roughly 60 investors, roughly 60. 
So a few traveled to Austin. The others I had intended on setting leads to the various legal attache offices that covered Germany, Switzerland, and Austria to send them leads to go out and interview the investors and collect any evidence they might have. But my colleagues at the IRS CID, they had different intentions. During the summer of 1994, two of the IRS CID agents that I was working with, they, they did what I call a world tour of Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, where they interviewed a lot of the people that were defrauded. In the FBI and vernacular, we would call that a boondoggle. Yeah. <laughs> but more, more power to them. More power to them. I asked my supervisor about going with them to conduct the interviews, but he laughed. He laughs and he says, that is why we have legal attache offices. <laughs> but the two agents, they were kind enough to bring me back a nice German beer stein from Munich that I, that I display to remember their European world tour. <laughs> <laughs> Having a great time. Wish you were here. Exactly. There was one German investor who came to meet with us, and he talked about getting a cold call about investing in this project called Eagle 31. He said that he was guaranteed 2% a month. And he said he was told that this oil well had proven reserves of over $100 million, and in the next 20 years would produce $63 million in oil and gas. And he agreed to invest $40,000. He said a couple months later, he got another call, a very high pressure call the second time to invest in a new project that guaranteed a rate of return of 3.5% a month. So if you think about it, 3.5% rate per month, that's 42% for the year. Wow. And this, this guy, he's, this German, he, he told me that he called Dudoff to complain. And Dudoff said, well, hey, you know, come over here to America. Let me show you our operation. I'll show you that this is a good project. The German investor, he flies over and was here for several days with the intention of seeing an oil well. But instead, they just drove around the Austin area and Dudoff showed him producing wells for informational purposes. In spite of that, this German, he left Austin satisfied and fully believing in First Eagle Oil production company. And so he went back to Germany and he starts promoting it to his friends. Oh no. Yeah. Several of the investors, they were defrauded in other projects unrelated to Dudoff. Their names were passed to first Eagle oil salesmen, or sometimes these salesmen, they brought the investors' names with them. Now that's something I think that continues today among con men where they're so lists, sucker lists. And, you know, people that have, been, you know, been suckered before, they sell their names sell for higher amounts just because they've been gullible enough to invest. There was another investor who traveled over to meet with us. It was an Austrian woman. And I remember she had jet black hair. She had also been defrauded previously. She had invested $72,000 in an emu farm investment scam. Kind of like in the mid-90s. I don't know about, you know, in Philadelphia or in the Northeast, but in the mid-90s in, in Texas, emu farms were all the craze. The people were investing in these emu farms and emus are going to be raised and sold for their meat. I look back now and I think, have you ever seen emu meat on a menu? I know I never have. It was just a scam. It was a scam. But this lady, she had invested $72,000 in this emu scam. And then she gets reloaded at First Eagle Oil Company. And she invested another $110,000 in Dudoff's company. But what's interesting about this lady, this investor, I'm so thankful that we interviewed her because she provided some really interesting information about our CW, about our cooperating witness. She told us that the day after Dudoff was arrested, the CW told her that he had worked for the FBI and that he had stopped working for the FBI a year or so earlier because his wife wanted him to stop. And he showed her an ID with a gold star on it, but said he didn't have an FBI ID because he didn't work with them anymore. She provided information. She told us that the CW bragged to people that he would take care of their issues and problems because he had contacts with the FBI. And that uh, would be he you. told her that, yeah, yeah, that would be me. Yeah, that would be me. <laughs> so needless to say, I was not too happy when I heard that. But he had told her that there were about a hundred thousand dollars in Dudoff assets that were frozen in Florida, and for a thousand dollars he could pay the judges to get the assets released. 
Uh, and she actually paid him $1,500 to travel to Florida, check on that emu investment, because supposedly this emu farm that she had invested in was actually in Florida. He inferred to her that he could use his position with the FBI to make the situation more amenable to the courts. She told us that he'd actually encouraged her not to meet with the FBI because it could be uncomfortable for her. So sources can be good and sources can be bad. And sometimes the best sources are the most problematic. Absolutely. And they play both sides. Right. It's I talked a- to the source about the allegations. I did. I talked to the source without specifically naming the Austrian investors by name. I just said I had heard from several people, you know, that he'd been saying these things. And of course, he denied it. And he said, well, some must have been lost in translation because a lot of these people don't speak English and they rely on First Eagle oil production salesman as their translator. I think there was some merit to her allegations. I do. Again, this source, he himself in some ways was a con man. He was likable. He could talk about a lot of different things and he was always looking to make money. But I'll tell you what, I distanced myself from him, didn't encourage him to provide me information on any other matters because he was telling me about other things that were going on. But I just knew this was going to be a problem later on and didn't want a whole lot more to do with him. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. In preparing for this interview, I almost called the CW because he still lives in the Houston area and ask him, you know, hey, what are your recollections of the case? But then I thought, no, I just don't think so. I'm just going to leave that alone. Were you concerned that you may have to use him in a trial, uh, you know, to provide testimony in a trial and you would have to bring this up? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, immediately made the AUSA aware of it, as well as the IRS CID agents, because I wanted to make sure the AUSA was aware of it and be prepared for it down the line. But thankfully, we never had to do that because Dudoff pled guilty. Oh, he did? Um, yeah, he did. We arrested him in January of 1994. Late spring, his attorney had indicated that Dudoff was interested in pleading guilty. August the 22nd, there was a superseding information that was filed charging him with money laundering. United States Code 1957, which is the money spending statute. So if you've got ill-gotten gains and you spend them in increments of greater than $10,000, you can be charged with the money spending. So the fact that he bought those two cars, that in and of itself was considered money laundering. We charge him in this information with money laundering and also false statements and application for a passport, which is Title 18, United States Code 1542. Dudoff subsequently pled guilty on September, I'm sorry, on September 12th, 2000, uh, September the 12th, 1995 in U.S. District Court in Austin. So he was sentenced to 10 years on the money laundering count and five years on the passport fraud. And the judge allowed him to serve those concurrently, meaning that if you serve them consecutively, that would have been 15 years. But if you serve them concurrently, essentially the five years is served at the same time as the 10 years. So he would have served 10 years in prison, less any time off for good behavior. But Dudoff was sentenced on March the 2nd, 1995. It's sentencing. Defendants are given the opportunity to make a statement. A lot of them express remorse and they try to mitigate their criminal actions. All Dudoff said was, I'm sorry for what I did and ask for mercy. That's all. You know, he asked for mercy, but he certainly didn't show his victims any mercy. Dudoff's attorney argued against an upward departure for being a leader at the sentencing, saying that nobody else had been charged. So how could Dudoff be a leader if nobody else was charged? But the probation officer who wrote the pre-sentence report told the judge that the upward departure for being a leader was appropriate because Dudoff had set up an international worldwide criminal enterprise and couldn't have done it by himself, that he started the business, paid the bills. He was a leader. So the judge dismissed that or denied that, that motion from Dudoff's attorney. Dudoff's attorney also requested that no fine or restitution be imposed since he didn't have the means to pay either. Actually, believe it or not, the judge did not order restitution. Did not order restitution in the case, but did impose a $50,000 fine. Do you think Um, that had a lot to do with the fact that by the time he would have been in a position to earn money, that he probably would not be earning that money here in the United States? Yes, that's why. That's why. I mean, the judge knew that once Dudoff served out his prison sentence, he would be deported. 
he wouldn't be allowed to stay in the U.S. So I think that's why. I was really, quite honestly, I was surprised that the judge even imposed a fifty thousand dollar fine. Because Dudoff would not have had the money to pay the fine either. It's interesting too that Dudoff's attorneys asked that he be allowed to serve his incarceration at the Federal Correctional Institute in Bastrop, Texas, which is not too far from Austin, saying that Dudoff's girlfriend and her family lived in the area. And the judge said, well, you know, I'm not going to make a recommendation because when I make a recommendation, the Bureau of Prison, they don't listen to me. And actually, Dudoff served out his prison sentence at uh, the Federal Correctional Institute in Greenville, Illinois, which is about 50 miles east of St. Louis. One thing I want to say before I end, I want to end with this. You know, we had outstanding prosecutorial support for this case. The United States Attorney's Office in Austin is part of the Western, what's called the Western District of Texas, which is a large district. It stretches all the way to El Paso, all the way down to the Rio Grande Valley, the border with Mexico. But that office was extremely aggressive and had great prosecutors. I worked a dude off case with an AUSA named Robert Pittman. And he was always available 24-7, and he was a real agent's prosecutor. Everybody loved working with Robert Pittman. And Robert Pittman today is now a United States District Court judge in Austin, Judge Pittman. Well, I think the last time that we spoke during the Enron episode, we had an opportunity to find out when you joined the FBI and, and why you joined the FBI. So we won't cover that again. We're at that point where I give my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? You know, Jerry, I want to dedicate this podcast to my friend and FBI colleague, Special Agent Brian Cruz, with whom I worked for over four years on the Enron case. Brian's life was tragically cut short in 2018 from cancer as a result of his evidence response team work at the World Trade Center following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. You know, Brian was a great agent and a good man. So I want to dedicate this to him. He was just an agent that worked hard his entire career. Great sense of humor, a good agent that you would want to work with. Everybody enjoyed working with Brian. So I want to thank God for the wonderful FBI career that I had. I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. I worked great cases. I had the opportunity to travel around the country and the world had good supervisors for the most part, worked with top-notch people, and I made lifelong friends. You know, I, I hope that people listening to agents like myself on your podcast might be inspired to pursue an FBI career. They will not be disappointed. I can tell them that for sure. You know, I also want to thank my mom and my dad for being such great parents. They set an example for my brothers and I. My dad worked 80 to 100 hours a week to make certain we had a good life and, and lifestyle. And he, he sacrificed tremendously for our, our family. And lastly, you know, one thing I want to do is I want to thank all the people with whom I worked and who helped me along the way. Because without their assistance, guidance, and mentoring, I would have never had the successful career that I had. I'm indebted to them. And so I want to thank them. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Michael E. Anderson and links to newspaper articles about this case. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired, Case File View, FBI Crime Dramas, Books, TV, and Movies, and tell you what they get right and what they get wrong. When you join my reader team, I'll send you a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have appeared on this podcast. Nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You can join my reader team at jerrywilliams.com, or if you're listening to this episode on a podcast app, there's a link in the description of this episode. Make sure to pick up your copy of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, and the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold. I want to thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.